sentence uh, a, a child to uh, life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Uh, that doesn't serve society uh, in, in any way. Um, a person sentenced to uh, such a, uh, a draconian penalty, uh, you might as well give up on life. And all of the good things that he could do for society are not going to happen. Hi, I'm Jessica Schwab, and as recent events have placed issues of social justice at the forefront of America, I sought out individuals within the fields of law enforcement and government intelligence to gain a deeper understanding of the trajectory of these national issues. Dr. Geraldine Downey, the chair of Columbia's psychology department, discusses the idea of the optimism and power that surrounds the identity of a college student versus the sort of death of hope and potential that surrounds the identity of a prisoner, sort of like a premature death. Uh, have you ever seen this transition occur within some of your clients, particularly those who encounter the criminal justice system at a very young age? I could have somebody that's 15 years old in the juvenile court, or I could have somebody at 18 years old. It's a big difference, um, but still considered a youthful offender. Their background first plays a, a large part in it. So if I get somebody that comes from a, from a strong family, has a strong family bond, has an intact household, has gone to school, um, whether it's a public or private school, and are involved with their community and their education. Um, there's other times, though, I'll get a kid in here that's 17 years old, um, and it could be the third time that he was, has been arrested, or even the first. But oftentimes, the biggest difference I see is the community and the backgrounds of each of them. Do you see many of the same clients more than once? I do. I see um, a lot of clients uh, more than once. So Dr. Downey also notes that being a college student inside of prison cuts the rate of recidivism by about 50%. And there are also many statistics that have shown that higher educational attainment correlates with a lower crime rate. So what percentage of your clients would you say have either a high school degree or a college degree or even a doctoral degree? What I see more often is that there it's their socioeconomic factors that play a role into whether or not they're a repeat offender. It's where they grew up, it's how they grew up, and it's the people that they surround themselves with. So there are new discussions and debates that surround juvenile incarceration um, that have now emerged through the neuropsychological lens that proposed questions that now ask how culpable really is a minor or how culpable really is a young adult. Elizabeth Scott, a professor of law at Columbia University, elucidated in her work entitled Brain Development, Social Context and Justice Policy that the main difference between the underdeveloped mind of a young person and the more developed mind of an adult is that juvenile brains are, quote, more sensitive to rewards and more inclined towards reward seeking. And also that, quote, when adolescents are emotionally aroused by the anticipation of rewards in the presence of their peers, they tend to make riskier choices that they are less able to control than do adults. So do you think New York State's statutes account for this inherent propensity within teenagers to be more reckless and therefore susceptible to crime? Not really. Uh, the statutes uh, take into account the age uh, of the defendant, uh, the history of the defendant in terms of prior culpable acts and uh, school and how well this particular defendant uh, gets along with others. Um, but as far as the court is concerned, uh, we treat every defendant that comes before us uh, in terms of what they're capable of and what they've done. Um, I take into account uh, all the time, no matter who the defendant is, the uh, specifics of the uh, crime and uh, the behavior of the defendant in court and um, whether the defendant uh, realizes that what he or she has done is uh, is wrong in terms of our society. Um, but uh, 
I certainly do not rely on statistics to uh, generate justice in my court and do the right thing. So Bernard Harcourt, a professor of law and political science at Columbia University, discusses in his book Against Prediction, Profiling, Policing, and Punishing in an Actuarial Age, the trend towards utilizing these actuarial or statistical methods within law enforcement and the many overlooked shortcomings of relying on trying to predict past, present, and future crime. So how does the Liberty Police Department incorporate or utilize crime data about certain groups of people, say, of a specific vocation or ethnicity? So while we do use crime data to allocate resources in our policing, we don't draw from the data uh, any inferences or preconceived notions based on someone's vocation, race, ethnicity, or any of those characteristics. Much more frequently we'll use uh, things such as location, time, patterns of uh, conduct and crimes to focus our targeted efforts. So Professor Harcourt warns that utilizing these actuarial methods in policing may actually counterintuitively increase crime. He says that because it is nearly impossible to predict a certain group's responsiveness or elasticity of, defending, of offending to increase policing, it may allow the non-profiled group to commit more crimes because there is less of a police presence within that area. Do you notice that the greater police profiling of certain groups or of certain areas throughout Liberty has been successful at reducing crime, or do you sometimes see the counterintuitive result occur within the non-profiled area? So that's an excellent point. One thing that we try and guard against is uh, implicit biases that all people have um, as we conduct our police work. I can't say that I've noticed an increase in crime in the uh, in individuals that may have been profiled based on their vocation or race or ethnicity, but I have seen a lack of trust and a lack of community togetherness that comes from, and not specifically with this department, but policing in general, if a uh, specific group of people feels that they are targeted because of their race, ethnicity, gender, religion, they lose trust in the police department, and without trust in the police department, they can't police a free society. So that would be what I would view as a major downfall to any biased-based or profile-based police. So moving into an evolving domestic issue, white supremacy. Uh, I know you've been retired for a bit, but what do you think the political or social future of America looks like if the kingpins of white supremacy groups with organizations like QAnon, and Proud Boys continues to go unchecked. I'm actually very worried about it. Um, we saw what happened on January 6th, and it was disgusting. Uh, it worries me quite a bit. I don't know exactly uh, what can be done other than, you know, we, we also have a freedom of speech, right? So people are allowed to have views that aren't necessarily in agreement with, with mainstream, and they're allowed to... to have anti-government views, but there needs to be that balance of hate and plotting criminal activity and all of these, um, the, the type of, of, of rhetoric that led to January 6th, there, that needs to be balanced against First Amendment rights because we all have the right to have a, a free and open society without fear of militia groups invading our capital. As you've heard, there are no clear solutions to the complex social issues that affect Americans each day. What we can do, however, is to keep on investigating and keep on asking questions, even when they might be uncomfortable. Thank you for watching.